It would help if we were on mute. So please. Hello? Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so um, welcome to rounds this morning and we'll get right into it. We will get right into it. There we go, ha <laughs> ha, we'll get right into it. Uh, so this is a four-year-old neutered male pit bull. Um, this globe was bouthalmic. Uh, they described severe conjunctival hyperemia and episcleral injection, corneal edema, peripheral corneal vascularization, some stromal corneal ulcers and hyphemic flare, they say, so probable blood in the eye. And then that's it. All they could see was the stuff up front uh, and nothing in the back. Um, this patient also has a uh, diagnosis in terms of general health, but I will uh, withhold that for now. Um, but it's a pretty significant diagnosis. Um, you know what, let's not withhold it. It's actually, uh, I changed my mind. Um, so this patient has recently been diagnosed with multiple myeloma and keep that in mind. Recently diagnosed, diagnosed with multiple myeloma. Um, so this globe is bouthalmic. Uh, the um, measurement did get left out in this image, uh, but uh, so you'll have to take my word for it. It's a quite large globe. Um, we ended up with it in a large slide. We'll see that on the subgross. Uh, the cornea is indeed quite uh, cloudy to opaque, uh, and the globe is indeed full of blood, not just the front, but also the posterior chambers as well. Um, we can make out the retina, which is detached and sort of fixed in the midst of this hemorrhage. Uh, and um, that's kind of all we can see. Uh, the other feature of this that you can kind of see based on artifacts, um, as my blade passed through this globe, there's this sort of chatter artifact. Um, and so basically the contents of this globe was, were very, very solid. Not all of it was opaque hemorrhage. Um, if you were to hold this section of globe up to the light, it would have looked like a stained glass window. Um, basically a lot of this is a, a high protein gel uh, along with the hemorrhage. And that is also significant. Um, so that's our gross exam. Let's head to histology. There we go. Let's see if we can make the, actually we probably want it like that. Make some gross work. The lowest mag is never the best for sub gross, but uh, I just wanna show off sort of the um, size of the globe really quick with this. So a pretty large globe, I'm on lowest magnification. It doesn't fit, uh, wah. But all right, here's our slightly closer subgross, which is still gonna be a little, here, let's flip this globe right way up. There we go. Which is still gonna be difficult to use because only the stuff in the center is in focus and this is a very large globe. Um, so we have our lens, we have all of this hemorrhage in the globe, but you can see that a lot of it, uh, so we have our erythrocytes here in the bright red, um, but a lot of the background here is just this pinkish, um, somewhat homogenous fluid. Um, so again, a very high protein fluid inside this globe admixed with the hemorrhage. Um, and we can see our detached retina, optic nerve head, and then detached retina, which is kind of uh, artifactually shifted to one side, but here it is coming out, just like we saw in our gross view. Let's take a look at this globe a little closer than that. So to orient you, we've uh, now rotated the globe 90 degrees clockwise. Our cornea is on our right. Um, going briefly front to back, we do have this very prominent peripheral corneal stromal vascularization, really dense vessels reaching into the cornea from the periphery. Um, we have these multifocal breaks and decimates with this cute little fibrous reaction at the site. So here's an end. Here's an end, little fibrous reaction bridging that. Um, and these are most likely Hobbes stria just because the globe is so huge. Moving towards the back, all of that high protein fluid admixed with hemorrhage. And then the main event here is the retina and what's going on around the retina. Um, we have a cupped and atrophied optic nerve to your left, but let's focus in on the retina here. So we have detached retina coming up through here. And we have all this pinkish stuff next to it. If we look closer at what this pinkish stuff is, we have fibrin and hemorrhage and spindle cells and blood vessels sort of organizing all that fibrin and hemorrhage. Let me see if I can actually find you a recognizable retina next to this here really quick, hang on. There we go. 
So we can just barely make out some of the, thank you. We can just barely make out some of the layers of the retina here. It's a very severely atrophied retina. And then next door, all of the, the spindle cells organizing the fibrin and blood. Um, if we track along the retina here uh, and go past that area, here's more really severely atrophied retina. And then coming into here, we still have the outline of the retina. It's a sort of slab of tissue, but the cells here are all dead. Um, so we have pycnotic nuclei. We don't have much distinction of the layers of the retina or cell borders. Um, so this is a really severely and extensively necrotic retina as we track along here. So detached and necrotic retina. And um, one thing that I would say is that when we're looking at this um, area of hemorrhage that's, uh, and fibrin that's being organized by spindle cells, often extending from a necrotic retina, we usually refer to this as fibrinoproliferative lesion. Um, and if you see this type of pattern inside the eye with a lot of hemorrhage and retinal detachment, uh, I would strongly suggest in most of these cases that you go look at the blood vessels in the eye, um, particularly in a dog looking at the central choroidal vessels and the vessels around the optic nerve um, and the retinal vessels themselves, uh, which are common places for uh, vascular remodeling associated with hypertension to appear. Um, however, in this case, this is not a hypertension case, just a uh, plug to make sure you look at your vessels if you see this pattern. Um, in this case, if we do look at the vessels, there's something else that's interesting to see. So in particular, these vessels that are all around the optic nerve, the serum essentially behind these erythrocytes and vascular lumens is quite high protein or very pink as well. Uh, again, with the condenser, ha ha, there we go. Even better when the condenser is in, there you go. See all of this pink serum. I'm gonna stop moving around and just let it sit here. Um, so uh, the, these features, uh, if we had uveal necrosis, it would be even better. There isn't really convincing uveal necrosis in section. Uh, however, there's a lot of distortion in the uvea from Bluthalmia. Um, so retinal necrosis, uveal necrosis, a mixture of hemorrhage and very high protein fluid inside the eye, and then seeing this high protein fluid in the vessels um, is suggestive of a condition we call, uh, or that is called hyperviscosity syndrome. Hyperviscosity syndrome. Um, so basically this is a condition that occurs in any uh, of a number of underlying conditions that result in a higher viscosity blood. Um, so there are a number of possible causes of that. Uh, multiple myeloma, which can result in uh, hyperglobulinemia, uh, um, it can be a cause of hyperviscosity. Um, so this dog kind of has an even better history to go along with these findings inside the eye. So uh, just an interesting cause of vascular disturbance, in essence, uh, and intraocular hemorrhage inside the eye. And um, yeah, that's kind of uh, this case. You would expect it to be bilateral? Not necessarily. I feel like we always get one eye in these cases. It could be bilateral because it's a, a systemic condition manifesting in the eye, ocular manifestation of systemic disease. Um, yeah, how often have we gotten bilateral? Yeah, it's usually unilateral. Often. Yeah. I mean, I think it's like it systemic systemic hypertension. Like we sometimes get uh, different severities or manifestations in, in both eyes. Like one eye may present blown up with hemorrhage and the other with just multifocal retinal hemorrhages. You know, I'd, I'm not sure why the, the difference in manifestation between the two eyes, despite being a systemic condition. Um, yeah, good question. Uh, this, that, yes. Is this then... something from Susan Carrasco? It was. Yeah, so Katie LeBlanc saying if this was submitted by Dr. Susan Carrasco, it was just one eye. And yes, this was submitted by Dr. Susan Carrasco. Yes, I didn't note, they do say for the other eye uh, that there were grayish punctate foci in the tapetal fundus and few peripapillary retinal hemorrhages, uh, as well as a partial uh, serous retinal detachment ventrolaterally. So there were some changes in the other eye, but certainly not as severe as this one, which is not interesting. Probably glaucoma, which is the main reason why they even created it. Mm -hmm, yeah. The eye is still comfort comfortable and visual. The animal probably would keep it. <laughs> um, all right, yeah. Any other uh, questions or comments about this case? Uh, very good case. Um, or a, a classically diagnostic uh, case, at least. Um, all right, this next case is really cool. They're all cool. 
Uh, so this is a uh, seven year, three month old neutered male carrier mix. Um, so they describe in the right eye, which is the one we have, uh, bufalmus, zonules and ciliary processes are visible, which usually means that they're kind of stretched out. Um, you shouldn't really see the zonules because they're tight from the front of the eye. Um, the lens capsule is filled with blood and there is no view of the fundus. So once again, we're kind of seeing some, oh, and also a fibrinous sheet over the iris and lens capsule. So all, again, we're kind of seeing stuff in the front of the eye and then the posterior segment was hard to see. Um, and they say that they have a couple of differentials, uh, including persistent hyperplastic uh, primary vitreous. So persistent fetal vasculature can present with chronic hemorrhage in the eye later in life, even though it's uh, kind of congenital condition um, or trauma or unlikely neoplasia. Uh, and when Gillian cut this globe open, we said, mm, trauma. Uh, so <laughs> what we have here are the two halves of the globe. That's why it kind of looks like it's ref a reflection of itself. So two halves of the globe. Um, and th with optic nerve heads, uh, there can be only one. <laughs> However, <laughs> there kind of seem to be two here. So this is the real optic nerve head and we have the retina coming out as a detached retina here. Um, and this is not optic nerve head. This is the second half. Um, and as you may have noticed, there's this little brownish sort of oval in cross section thing here. Um, and it's tacked straight through the retina. And in this other half, we can kind of see it passing underneath the semi-opaque retina and into the sclera here. So uh, this was a linear foreign body that was pinned through the retina and extending through the scler posterior sclera as well. Uh, other things that are of interest in this eye, we have a posterior synechia with the iris leaflets thin and billowing forward, so consistent with an iris bombay, at least grossly. Um, we have this, which is the lens capsule, but there are no appreciable lens fibers to be seen. It is indeed filled with blood, at least in our view. Um, and uh, we already mentioned the retinal attachment, so uh, these are the main findings to see grossly, pretty grossly impressive. Um, and it's also cool histologically. Cool to examine as an enucleotide one uh, to specify. Um, I am going to choose this one. That linear foreign body has not sampled perfectly, but there is one section where we can kind of see what it's made up of, and we're going to pick that one. Here it is. Um, actually, let's quickly give us a sub gross one step at a time. So the lens capsule isn't completely sampled, but we can see that here's our lens capsule here. Again, empty of lens fibers. We can get uh, some of our retina coming in through here. It's a little bit tangential at this level. And we have this sharply demarcated hole in the retina, which is where our foreign body passed through. And then the foreign body itself sampled kind of wonky and is flopped out on one side here, but at least sampled and visible. So. Now let's take a closer look. Uh, again, to orient you, cornea to the right. And we're gonna, without further ado, pass right back to the foreign body. All right. So here it is in a uh, section, it's this oval shaped thing. Uh, the contents in the core have sort of shelled out funny, but this surrounding is still visible. And it kind of is reminiscent of a hair shaft, right? Uh, we have this somewhat melanized pink outer cuticle of sorts. Um, and the fun party trick is always to polarize it. So, aha, the... uh -huh, thank you. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh, yeah, got it. Uh, oh, the condenser isn't in again. All right. We're in rare form today. We got to push this in too. All right. Let's see. Yay. Ooh. Ooh. Ah. Ooh. So. Um, so that's our foreign body. Um, so it's a stiff, uh, linear structure. Pull that out on top. Pull that out on top. Aha. Yes. Thank you for reminding me. Um, it's a stiff linear structure that kind of is reminiscent of a hair. Uh, so perhaps a modified hair. Um, and based on our past experience, this, uh, histologic and gross presentation is most likely a porcupine quill. Um, so this is uh, porcupinosis, that's not an official name, um, but uh, this is a porcupine quill entering the eye, um, jokingly referred to as porcupinosis because we've seen this in eyes before. Um, and the idea behind why this happens 
Uh, dogs may, uh, this, there's a, it's actually a paper published on this um, if anyone wants to look it up. Um, but the idea behind this is that dogs may even several years before presenting with ocular signs have a porcupine related incident um, where they make a quill in the face. Um, and then the quills are kind of designed to go in and not as easily come out. They have these sort of posteriorly facing spines, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so as the dog, if one kind of gets implanted near the eye, as the dog's eye sort of moves and the muscles, uh, you know, move things back and forth, uh, the quill may kind of slowly get pushed in, but not back out. Um, and over time, eventually penetrate the eye and cause hemorrhage and glaucoma and other things that result in nucleation. Um, so uh, in this case, even though they didn't uh, note a recent porcupine incident, uh, it may have happened some time ago. Uh, this is most likely kind of how things progress. Um, some other neat things in this eye, just because I love saying this word, such a fun word, ferrugination. It's one of my favorites, let's get it in focus. Here we go. Um, so this is uh, retinal blood vessels that have this deeply basophilic wall, most likely deposition of iron salts in those vessel walls uh, associated with chronic hemorrhage, just kind of a neat looking uh, finding histologically. Uh, and the other cool thing is we have that site where oh, the, it did, yes, actually, that's a good point. Before we move on, let's one thing at a time. Leandro asked if the lens capsule ruptured. Imagine like a uh, porcupine, porcupine quill lens caps or lens fiber lollipops or <laughs> go inside the lens. Yes, or perhaps a cake pop. Right. Uh, so here is one end of the ruptured posterior lens capsule. Yes, indeed, the lens capsule has ruptured. It's kind of reduplicated itself as well to some extent, but this curled up end and we have the end right there. So uh, lens capsule rupture posteriorly right where the porcupine quill is. Uh, we assume that the porcupine quill traumatized the posterior lens as well as stuck itself through the retina. Do we know anything about the timeline? Because it's impressively devoid of lens fiber, like everything has been completely resorbed, right? Is that, is that they Is don't give us a listed, yeah, CNN. yes. The lens fibers didn't see any lens fibers. There was hemorrhage inside the lens capsule. Wow. Um, yeah, as you, as you might expect. Um, so yeah, presumably the lens fibers were resorbed and uh, we don't have a duration listed um, and we haven't gotten any information about a potential porcupine event and when that may have happened. Uh, and then this is posterior sclera. Let's step as far back as we can go. This is posterior sclera right where the porcupine quill went in. So we have choroid on one side, choroid on the other. The sort of regular dense collagen fibers of the sclera are disrupted by a more disorganized fibrous tissue in the middle. And then we have this sharply demarcated space where the quill had passed through. Just in general, sorry. And again, to through the retina. Again, hang on the yeah, it's no, such a great example. Like every time. You know, for resident students, every time you see like on histology something exquisitely geometrical like this, so go back a little bit towards the square. See how squared up that is. Like, yeah. Very few things in nature look that geometric. So, and nothing in the eye particularly. So just uh, it's a good uh, suggestion that there was something there that shouldn't be there mm -hmm. for a body. Or you see that a lot in the eye with. Uh, Intraocular lenses like IOLs from cataracts or degrees. Yeah, we'll, we'll get an example of that later. <laughs> cool. Got some thunder stealing. Uh, spoiler alert. Um, so, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, this porcupine quill didn't really sample well in all sections. Uh, there are some fragments of it here, um, but it has left behind its mark. Uh, and we know that something was there based on the shape that it's left behind. Um, yeah, any other questions or comments? Really cool case. It's a great case. Um, I'm wondering if because of the location of the perforation, it's very, very posterior. Mm -hmm. Are there any other instances where you have seen entry of a foreign object that close to sort of the optic nerve? Yes, so that is a good, a good question. So the question is any uh, other instances of entry of a foreign object that close to the optic nerve and sort of commentary on like the location of entry. Um, and so uh, I think that brings an interesting discussion. Uh, where did this porcupine quill embed in the dog's face and like what was the path or the trajectory? Um, it is possible that this porcupine quill was actually ultimately in the mouth, the oral cavity, and then could have kind of penetrated up from there. Um, I would wonder about that. 
Um, but I mean, there may have been another path. It's difficult to tell at this point. Uh, generally speaking, this uh, brings up something that's a nice thing to mention. Uh, if you have a site of penetration in the globe and it's more of a ventral uh, orientation, you could consider the oral cavity as a site of original penetrating trauma. Um, if it's more dorsal, it tends to be more likely that it came from outside the patient's face. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe this dog bit on a porcupine a little bit, <laughs> but we won't know, I think for sure. <laughs> when dogs get porcupine clothes throughout their face, it's usually because they're fighting. Yeah. You know, they usually have to you know, extract thousands of yep. from their mouth and their face. And so that's, yeah. yeah. Another yeah. thing that might happen with the eye, particularly, because if you think about the orbit, you got all the extraocular muscles, they form a cone yeah. that narrow things down kind of towards the back of the eye. So if you have any uh, something migrating, that it gets into the orbit, if it's not really kind of stuck right through, if it's free there, it might be uh, guided towards the back of the eye by the cone of extraocular muscles. Uh, and that's another thing to consider. But the mouth is an excellent way of getting things inside the orbit too. Mm -hmm. So other than a porcupine quill, are there other things that you've seen do that? Like cactus quills, okay. Okay. Cactus, uh, 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 spines or um what are they called the, the grass, grass ons. grass ons yeah um yeah, yeah. Sticks, sticks bits of wood yeah stick in the eye yeah there was dental one probes dental probes during dental procedures yeah not less than a migratory more like a force traumatic mm. event yeah yeah one time a cat claw sheath, but that one came in from the front. <laughs> uh, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Good discussion. Okay. I will hand over the, oh, I will finish the PowerPoint and then I will hand over the floor. Here's the PowerPoint, penetrating linear ocular form. Uh, and we're gonna go. All right, um, next up, uh, we have the right eye from an 11 year, nine month old, um, unspecified breed dog uh, with the very brief history of bilateral glaucoma that developed after bilateral cataract surgery. And that's what we have. Um, so um, here is our gross. Um, got the cornea oriented up at the top. Um, it is very opaque and it's very thickened. Um, it's kind of hard to make out definitive borders here. Here's our iris leaflets. Um, and then speaking of geometric shapes here, um, there is this sort of thin, clear rectangular um, shape um, right where the lens should be. Um, and this is our intraocular uh, lens uh, that they've placed in here after their cataract surgery. Um, uh, the retina is detached and maybe a little bit torn. And that's what we have for our gross view here. So. All right. Uh, so cornea up at the top, we can see that there is a little divot in here that should not be there. Um, again, iris leaflets here from the pigment that you can pick out. Um, this is sort of leftover lens capsule. Um, you can see it a little bit. It's a little bit kind of square shape on the edges. edges um, and we'll take a closer look at that. And then again, our detached retina, a little bit torn um, as well. All right. All right. So um, we have a very, very busy cornea. 
Uh, we've got thickened corneal epithelium coming over here, and we can see a big uh, loss in the corneal stroma. The epithelium is kind of coming down, growing over it, and coming up the other side. Um, and then there's a full thickness break here um, that is filled with fibrin and neutrophils. And if we go a little bit closer, um, there is a fragment of decimase membrane kind of outside the eye, which is not where it's supposed to be. Um, so uh, when we have kind of free fragments of decimase membrane floating around in a corneal rupture, um, we kind of like to think that it's probably a ruptured desmetaseal um, that's happened. Um, and so here is our fibrin and neutrophils and hemorrhage that's heading into the eye. Yeah, here we go. Here is the end of decimase membrane, all nice and curled. Lots of fibrin and hemorrhage again. Stands back here. Um, got some kind of bunching up of the iris leaflet. It's a little bit nubbined, nubbinified, kind of stubby. Um, Got some corneal edema and again, more inflammation on this side. Um, and then here we have what's left of our lens capsule. Um, so we have the anterior lens capsule here that is thicker um, and there is a large gap between that side and this side. Um, so this would be the capsulotomy site um, from where they went in and took out all the lens fibers. Um, and then again here um, at the equator, We've got a nice like rectangular shape um, from where the uh, intraocular lens was sitting. Um, they're usually pretty easy to cut through um, grossly and we don't always get them in section because they're sort of this faint outline here. And so the sort of like folded material here that if I run my finger sort of over the light source here, it kind of uh, highlights it. it. I digitally polarize it. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, so these angular shapes here is what's left from the intraocular lens that's sort of folded over on itself um, from the cutting and processing. Um, so that's uh, always fun to see. And then if we keep going back, um, our retina here is diffusely detached um, and is torn got nice rounded edges here um, to the retina. Um, and then we can't really say much about the optic nerve head because it's a little bit distorted from the detachment, but the optic nerve looks um, okay. Um, so uh, got a, a pretty uh, rocking inflammation and stuff associated with the desmetaseal um, that probably ruptured um, at this point. Not really sure what led to the initial insult of the corneal disease. Uh, sometimes we can find the surgery site, um, but that wasn't really um, attainable with all the other changes here going on. Um, How long ago after the surgery did they nucleate? Do we know that? Or... No. Yeah, though that that kind of information is important because some, mm -hmm. some things are very chronic, and if you know, you can have some corneal instability because of the surgery and there are things that can happen post, like immediately post-surgical weeks after, but if it's months, then we're thinking something likely unrelated to the surgical procedure itself, or like a secondary corneal disease or something like that. Yeah. Um, so, um, both eyes have disease? The question was, did both eyes have corneal disease? Um, both, it says bilateral glaucoma after bilateral cataract surgery. And that is, that's the extent of our, our history. Um, they, they were unable to determine the IOP of this eye um, uh, because of soft tissue on the cornea. Um, but 
it had a history of glaucoma. So you're welcome. All right. Um, so yes, uh, kind of a status post-operative cataract surgery with a um, intraocular lens placement. Um, our axial rupture um, consistent with a death metaseal and all the inflammation and reepithelialization and stuff going on with that. Um, all the fibrin and neutrophils in the anterior cha chamber, retinal detachment, and then the glaucoma as per history since the retina was detached and we couldn't really evaluate um, for glaucoma just changes there. All uh, right. Uh, so next up, I have a rabbit. Hey, this is the right eye um, from an unknown age, unknown sex, and unknown breed of rabbit. Um, but uh, we do have a history of diffuse keratitis, fibrosis, and edema uh, with a suspect uh, for an intraocular mass. Um, they called this eye uh, thesis bulbi. Um, has been going on for about eight months. Uh, they do say that the other eye um, does have a hyper uh, mature to hyper mature cataract with a lens induced uveitis um, and neovascularization with flare. Uh, otherwise, the rabbit is healthy. Um, they did note um, that uh, they uh, had an iatrogenic scleral rupture during the surgery uh, for removal, um, which is always nice to know ahead of time just so we can keep an eye out for it. Um, so this is uh, our, our globe, cornea, ooh, again, up at the top. Um, here is uh, iris and yep, there's a uh, white mass here um, in the iris tissue. Our lens is kind of cloudy. Um, retina again, looks really detached, kind of thick. Um, and then this right here is kind of the hole at the back of the uh, globe. Um, and this is sort of uh, some sclera being partially cut off um, when they uh, incise through it. So we didn't really have a good, a view of the optic nerve head or optic nerve um, in our sample, uh, but uh, I think we will be okay without it in this case. Okay. Let's see. All right. Uh, okay. So some gross of our uh, rabbit eye here, We've got cornea up at the top, looking a little bit cellular. Um, we can see a lot of squiggly pink lines in here. We'll take a look at that. Um, here is iris. And again, um, that white mass tissue um, subgross is very uh, highly cellular. And we can see a little bit more of it um, on the other side. Um, here's our lens. Um, again, kind of our detached retina here and then we lost uh, that posterior part of the sclera from the iatrogenic rupture. All right. Um, so again, cornea here, kind of very thick and helper cellular. Um, again, here are these uh, pink uh, membrane uh, decimates membrane uh, there. And we'll go back to that after we take a look at this hypercellularity here. Um, and so the iris um, is expanded and effaced by this population of neoplastic ground cells. Closer. Um, so um, we've got uh, lots of round cells in here uh, forming sheets. We've got uh, mitotic figures. It was pretty mitotically active. Um, I think I got 135 on the mitotic figure count. Um, they've got round over nuclei, finely stippled um, with fairly prominent uh, nucleoli. Uh, we've got some heterophils scattered around in the background associated. Um, and then these areas here where there's just necrosis uh, associated with these neoplastic cells as well. Um, so these were 
looking like um, neoplastic lymphocytes, so a lymphoma. Um, pretty centered here um, in the anterior uvea. Here it is more on this side. Um, and then again, their keratitis and stuff that they were seeing uh, clinically. Uh, we got thickened uh, epithelium of the cornea here. Um, lots of uh, blood vessels coming in, um, lymphocytes, plasma cells, probably a few heterophils. Um, and then kind of deep in the stroma and overlying Desmase membrane, there's a lot of uh, uh, fibrosis and fibrovascular membrane formation and it's causing um, this nice wrinkling to Desmase, um, which is um, indicative of thesis bulbi when you get intraocular fibrosis and things start to shrink down, uh, which is what they were seeing clinically as well. Um, and then we've got some cataractus change here. So we've got some liquefaction of our uh, lens fibers. Um, and then heading back, um, our retina is detached and is very gliotic um, and atrophied um, here as well. Um, so we did offer um, a CD3, CD79A uh, uh, in this case, um, our CD20 um, immunohistochemistry uh, uh, reacts to rabbits. Um, so we chose a CD79A for our B cell lineage um, to try to avoid uh, sort of background staining um, associated with that. Um, so I'm going to start with the CD3 um, for T cells. Um, uh, we do have a, a red option for our CD3, uh, which is nice when we're uh, staining tumors that are in um, the anterior uvea because um, it's a little bit less messy with all the melanin pigment. Um, and if we look at the neoplastic population of cells, um, what we see with our CD3 red staining is that sort of, uh, we do have some staining in here, but it's sort of scattered around um, the larger um, non-staining cells. Um, so this is more indicative of sort of non-neoplastic T lymphocytes um, in here with the tumor. And perivascular as well. Thank you. Um, and then our CD79A, which we, we do not have a, a red option for maybe yet. It might be something that our histology lab is working on. Um, so it's going to go uh, more brown. And we can see that a larger um, percentage of these cells and the larger cells with the more prominent nuclei um, are staining uh, positive um, for the CD79A, uh, which would be consistent with a B cell lymphoma. Um, so we were unsure of this case, if this was sort of like a malignant transition from all the inflammation from the um, corneal disease, um, if this is was just a sort of solitary intraocular manifestation of lymphoma, or if it could represent um, systemic disease. Um, for this rabbit. Um, so um, unfortunately, uh, the rabbit uh, did not do well um, and ended up being euthanized. Um, and we don't have any other information on the, if it was a systemic thing, but maybe if it wasn't doing well, it was a bit more extensive than they initially thought. So that is our rabbit. Okay, our last two cases. Two cases, three eyes. This is a seven year old humane neutered mixed breed dog. As you can see, we have received a bilateral enucleation. Um, right eye, left eye. Right away, can notice 
how symmetrical the disease is. If I told you this is two halves of the same globe, you probably believe me, right? So clinically, they described um, squinting on both eyes, signs of inflammation. They treated without any improvement, yada, yada, yada. IOPs went up, bilateral glaucoma. They treated the glaucoma, but it did not respond well. The dog had also a decreased appetite and lethargy. Otherwise, it was healthy. They did some testing for uh, infectious agents and everything came back negative. So we received both globes, cut them up. And as I mentioned already, the most striking thing is the symmetry, right? The whole disease is, um, just pay attention how everything looks like it's centered in the uveal tissue. There is expansion of the iris, a little bit of the irritocornal angle, the ciliary body, and the choroid. We, uh, it's a mixed breed dog. So let's see, they said the eye color was brown. Um, believe that, but there's also this white tan infiltrate all throughout the uvea in both eyes, right? Another important thing to observe is how the chambers are relatively clean and quiet, and there's bilateral retinal detachment also. So I can choose, let's see, let's start. It doesn't matter to be honest, because they are identical as is, it is usually the case. So let's start with the left eye. So we're looking at OS. Okay, cornea on top, lens, iris leaflets, and ciliary body. An excellent correlation with the gross image. You can see how there is a basophilic infiltrate and some expansion of the choroid, the ciliary body, and the iris, a little bit towards the limbus and sclera also. But whatever that is, and you know, at this magnification, it's hard to define if this is neoplastic, inflammatory, or other, <laughs> people would say. But whatever that is, it's very uveal-centric. It's very uh, restricted to the uveal tissue. And that's one of the features of this disease that we're going to talk about. Getting a little closer. Ignore some of this artifact. Here's the cornea. Not much going on in the cornea. There is... There are some uh, cells free floating in the vitreous, a little uh, in the in the third chamber, a little bit, and you can see them um, attaching to the corneal endothelium. There, this will be clinically termed as uh, keratic precipitates, so a mixture of fibrin, red blood cells, and those are the things you would be able to see clinically if you're looking inside this eye, right? But that is not even the tip of the iceberg; it's just the beginning of it. The main thing is the if it trade throughout the uvea as we described. So mark expansion of the iris itself or the ciliary body. There's loss of the iris pigmented epithelium and the ciliary body. You can see the plica is sort of melting away as you will, right? And there's a lot of free melanin pigment. There's dispersion of pigment everywhere. When you go closer, and you will need to get closer, to make sense of this, you will see a mixed infiltrative population. We have a few neutrophils here and there, but a lot of macrophages in the background and mononuclear cells, lymphocytes, fewer plasma cells, then you get a little closer. And for um, those that are still awake and paying attention, you will notice a lot of melanin throughout, right? And the melanin here, it's a normal component of the iris, but in this case, it has kind of a peculiar distribution. Some of it, and you can see small tiny granules kind of free in the background of the slide, like it's you know, like the dirty background, a few of 
the the clusters they surround nuclei kind of like that so they're inside cells more specifically they're inside macrophages so these are melanomacrophages right so we call this pattern a pig, uh, pigment peppering like you're just throwing melanin in the background so there's disruption of the melanin uh, and now that you've seen it at low magnif uh, higher magnification you can see like, it's everywhere right so there are areas like that where it's obviously more histiocytic. So these are macrophages or histiocytes, if you will. Some are a little, they have an epithelioid arrangement or morphology. And you got a lot of melanin sprinkled in the background. Another interesting thing, if you look around and still talking about the melanin, the iris pigmented epithelium, there's a little, so you can see some of, normal iris pigmented epithelium right there and if you keep moving it disappears right and it is associated with areas like that where there's scattering of that pigment and more melanomacrophages or melanin laden macrophages there's also exudation of fibrin in the chambers it picks up again but then you know it goes in and out it's been affected the same thing goes with the ciliary body pigmented epithelium more than just the pigmented. In this case, we have both non-pigmented and pigmented epithelium gone, but it's easier to identify the pigmented epithelium gone uh, and this marked dispersion of melanin in the background. Um, just to confirm that we're dealing with the same thing throughout the uvea, let's dive here in the random section of the ciliary body. Again, large numbers of melanin-laden macrophages and free melanin in the background with lymphocytes, plasma cells, and some neutrophils here and there. The neutrophils I think are here more because there is some degree of necrosis throughout the uvea than anything else, right? And now we're moving towards the choroid, lots of pigment in the subretinal space, markedly thick in choroid. Let's do the same exercise. Let's go closer to the optic nerve. So we're getting closer to the optic nerve. Here's central choroid. Another beautiful example of a histiocytic, lymphoplasmocytic, inflammatory infiltrate with lots of melanin-laden macrophages throughout, right? So it's a pattern. Another thing that we look for is there's another pigmented epithelium here is the retinal pigmented epithelium which in this case is gone, All right? So I think you guys are catching up with the theme of this case, melanin being attacked, right? And if you move farther up, you can start seeing some of the pigmented RPE cells. RPE cells are fun because they are one of the few um, pigmented cells that have particularly interesting looking granules. Their, their granules are elongated kind of football shape, oh, sorry, American football shape. I want to ostracize the rest of the world. <laughs> I'm not bitter about that at all. <laughs> yeah, Australians too, yeah. So they are uh, elongated, you know, uh, and, and that it's very useful to identify RPE cells, not only histologically, but if you end up with a vitro cytology or something like that, and there's retinal detachment, RP cells are floating around, you can identify that by the elongated um, melanin granules. So they are suffering here too. Regardless of the shape of their granule, they are also in the mix. Another interesting thing here, you can see the inflammation extending around the beginning of the meninges here. So that area is... Uh, around the optic nerve is an extension of the choroid itself. So whatever amount of pigmentation you have on a choroid, you will see that going around the uh, shoulder of the optic nerve and through the lamina cribosa, which is the connective tissue that spans that the, the space of the sclera where the optic nerve exits. So the inflammation tracks there. So the main thing about this disease is how uveocentric the inflammation is where there's pigment, there's inflammation. If you don't have pigment, you don't see inflammation. For example, there's retinal detachment, as we have seen on the gross examination. How do we know? There are 
lots of cells free floating in, in the subretinal space. Of course, there's the separation itself, but that can be an artifact. Um, but the presence of cells underneath the retina, the atrophy of the photoreceptor segments, and sometimes you see macrophage just kind of nibbling at the at the photoreceptor segments. There, these are all like these guys. These are all features of real retina detachment. The retina is not normal by any stretch of the imagination because it is atrophied and detached, but it's not as inflamed or inflamed. Like, you know, there's a few lymphocytes and plasma cells in there, but it's not as severely inflamed as the choroid itself. So bilateral enucleation, a dog with a histocytic panuveitis that has lots of melanin-laden macrophages and um, free melanin in the background, retinal detachment, and a uveocentric sort of process and a very symmetrical disease. These are all classic features of uveal dermatologic syndrome or VKH-like disease. Um, if you just search our database for bilateral enucleation in dogs, the vast majority of the cases are gonna be VKH cases because they are one of the few situations where the disease is very symmetrical, both in appearance and clinical signs. So these dogs will develop bilateral glaucoma. The lesions are very symmetrical and they tend to be enucleated at the same time, as opposed to something like asymmetric uveitis or yeah, mostly asymmetric uveitis in this case would be the differential. Just to prove that, the, that symmetry, this is the other eye, this is the right eye. If I just told you this was the left eye, you'll probably believe me because it is identical. <laughs> and is this the right eye? Is this the left eye? Uh, you'll never know. No, I'm joking. This is the right eye. <laughs> Very symmetric, even like to the details of the infiltration around the optic nerve. It's impressive how symmetrical this is. If the inflammation is more severe, on the anterior uvea versus the choroid in one eye, it's going to be the same on the other eye. If it's more choroidal, heavy on one eye, it's going to be the same on the other eye. There is something beautiful about that. Just thinking about how random biology is, that you can get something like that, right? Other important things about this disease and the diagnosis. Uh, there are classic breeds. We all know them. We got the Arctic breeds. We got the, you know, the Japanese uh, breeds. We see BKH on everything from mixed breed dogs to chihuahuas to, so we, in our experience, we wouldn't rule out VKH based on an atypical, let's say breed. Now, the interesting thing, the classic lesions are, you know, the, the, it's, it's on the name uveal dermatologic syndrome. The lesions on the skin, they can be present along with the ocular disease, but they're often not present. Uh, most of our cases do not present with clinically observable cutaneous lesions by the time they get enucleated. If it's present, that's great. But again, do not rule out a diagnosis of VKH based on the absence of dermatologic disease. We had a few cases where, uh, serendipitous cases sort of where the clients are uh, ophthalmologists or you know the clients will uh, uh, describe that after the bilateral enucleation, then the dog started developing cutaneous lesions. I guess if you take all the melanin it was attacking to begin with, it's only left with the melanin in the skin. So the immunologic system goes, all right, took the eyes out. Now we're going to go after the skin, right? But it doesn't, uh, just in terms of uh, your diagnostic workup, do not rule out VKH based on those things. In the event that we receive only one eye, if you got classic lesions, we will make that diagnosis of VKH, but we often, if we don't have that information, we ask about the other eye. Very often when you ask, they will say that the other eye also has uveitis or it is affected. So that's also helpful in your ability to kind of confirm this. Do you know how many cases of bilateral like confirmed bilateral detach? Because I know we have at least two that the other eye is completely unaffected. It comes back as UVX. Do you have any how many come back as uveitis when- uh, As UDS that are truly unilateral. They are truly unilateral. I, I don't remember seeing any that were truly unilateral. Um, we would, I would almost doubt the diagnosis if it's purely unilateral. They say the other eye is completely normal. It will make me 
hesitant to confirm that if they just say there's nothing going on here. There is a variant of uh, uh, VKH that we see in blue-eyed dogs that are very low in melanin pigmentation to begin with. They tend to have a more bland form of the disease where the inflammation is not as severe, but is severe enough to cause glaucoma. So they will have secondary glaucoma with fibrovascular membranes, et cetera. And in those cases, it might be that the disease might be subclinical on the other eye or not as obvious in terms of like yeah. uveitis, the pigmentation and all, but. The one you had recently was a parent. Okay. Uh, but the other eye seems to be affected. Like it came back to the US, not country. Yeah, not so country. they're, yeah, they're talking about, uh, yeah. And the yeah. other one was, Okay. Interesting. So what Jen's saying is that they had two cases where it seems to be bilateral, uh, unilateral so far, um, and the dogs have what appears to be plastic age with even like cutaneous disease. Um, that's interesting. I, uh, that that had, it, it's hard because when you use that as your standard for the diagnosis, if you start excluding the ones that are unilateral, then it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy sort of situation. I think the other thing that's difficult uh, in using cobalt database to determine how many, maybe truly unilateral, is that we may get one eye, and then if the other eye goes bad, it may be equated not as an submitted finisterpath, or right. lost follow-up, or whatever else. So, yeah, for sure. you know, we may have many cases that we have one eye, but we may not necessarily know if that's a truly unilateral case. Yeah, that's Good why point. I was curious if you have actually like gone through and seen like how much you know, you have. Questions online? Yeah, and then we have a comments and questions. So one comment, um, Kelsey mentioned that uh, she had a case with one brown eye and one blue eye. Yep. And that the blue eye held on for a little bit longer than the brown eye, but did still eventually have to be mutated. So there's that situation to be um, considered. What was the breed of this dog? Mixed breed dog. Mixed breed dog. Okay, and then a uh, question was, uh, do we ever exclude infectious agents? We, uh, I, I wouldn't go after infectious agents on that because of the inflammatory pattern. It's very uveocentric. There's no exudation in the chambers whatsoever. It, it's a very classic pattern. Um, for anything infectious, I would expect at least some degree of um, uh, retinal association or any type of inflammation spilling over into the ocular chambers. This is very classic, and, uh, 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 um, especially with the bilateral presentation like that. Of course, you know, we have some complicated cases where, for example, they develop glaucoma, they might have developed like a corneal ulcer or a corneal rupture, then you have a secondary neutrophilic infection and an endophthalmitis because of that. Uh, those are a little bit more murky and I would probably go after or or or, or uh, suggest the possibility of of a you know a, a, a infectious process, but in a clean case like that, not necessary. From a pathologist's perspective, I think it's important to note that any like significant and extensive uveal necrosis can present with fair numbers of melanin laden macrophages, just because the pigment is being released. Yep. Um, so like just seeing melanin laden macrophages alone is not enough to make the diagnosis necessarily. Um, but yeah, it's also about uh, case presentation, the bilateral versus unilateral, the nature of the inflammation, so on and so forth. Excellent point. Yeah. No yeah. finding is an island, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. We had a few weird cases. So the, the cool thing about that is the, the pathophysiologist, the targeting of melanin or melanin related antigens, right? We had a few cases, Jen mentioned uh, Karen Terry. We had a Karen Terry with uveal melanosis that had VKH. And you can imagine what a disaster that was, right? Because there was melanin, you know, as much melanin as you wanted to create an inflammatory reaction. We had a dog that had VKH bilateral disease, but in one of the eyes, it had a melanocytoma. So the inflammation destroyed the tumor and there was pigment floating around everywhere and develop glaucoma. So you can see those things um, serendipitously happening around there. Anyone else? Do you guys have a comment? Yep. Yeah. Um, so do they usually, so they usually present acute bilateral though? It's not like a one eye and then the other. It, it's usually symmetrical. It's okay. usually bilateral. That's, uh, the, classic. that, that's classic. the classic presentation yeah. as, you know, 
Yes. Uh -huh. We there. just have these two weird ones that are like, it's definitely not teamed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then <laughs> what is, I guess, is like the percentage of the complaint? Usually, like, is it splitting or like it's a problem? So the question was, what's the, what is the presenting complaint usually? Usually like red eye or sometimes if you blindness, like it goes on for so long that like the owners don't notice until you don't blind, that kind of thing. Yeah. So anything, it, like any uveitis, um, red eye is much different. It's interesting. I talked to dermatologists about it a while ago. And if you talk to derm people, they would say that uvodermatologic syndrome is an ocular disease. Um, and I guess that goes towards the point that the ocular disease is e either more noticeable to begin with or more severe than the cutaneous disease to begin with. So they would say, I, I was told that downstairs, for example, here in the hospital, it's more likely that a dog will come through off though and then go to derm than the other way around. Yeah, we see a lot more of the too. So yeah, so just as a- ask us to tell them what we see them. <laughs> Yeah, thinking about presentation, what would you see in the clinic? Will probably yeah. be a dog with ocular problems. Okay, we just went over a little bit. Um, oh. Thanks, everyone. We do have another case, but we'll keep that for next time. Um, great to see everyone online. Great to see everyone here, and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you.